So what is mentioned over here? وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَ اللَّهُ مُبْدِيهِ وَتَخْشَ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَخْشَى You are fearing people, but remember that Allah is more deserving that you fear Him. Now think about it. What is it that prevents us from following the commands of Allah? In the previous ayah, what did we learn? We don't have a choice. What is it that prevents us from following the commands of Allah and His Messenger? Fear of people. They will object. They will point fingers. They will oppose. They will not support. But what do we see? What is the Prophet ﷺ advised over here? That Allah is more deserving that you fear Him. If you have more fear of Allah, then that fear will overcome the fear of people. You understand? If a person has more fear of Allah, that will overcome the fear of people. And that will enable him to obey Allah, even if people oppose him. Now, when is it that we're afraid of people? What will they say? This is what we're afraid of. What will they say? She's going to look at me like that. She's going to say this to me. They're going to say this. They're going to do this. This is what we're afraid of. The comments of people, the remarks of people, the behavior of people. But at that time, what should we think? What will Allah say? This is fear of Allah. What will Allah say? We should not be concerned about what people are thinking, but we should be concerned about our image before Allah. And if a person is concerned about his image before Allah, then what will happen? It will enable him to disregard the fear of people. Wallahu ahakku an taqsha. Allah is more deserving that you fear him. So what's the solution? Fear of Allah. Every time you think, Oh my God, I cannot face her. Think, I have to face Allah as well. This is what we think. How am I going to face that person? How am I going to face her? How am I going to face him? What is she going to say? What is he going to say? Think about it. Don't you have to go back to Allah? Isn't he going to call you to account? Isn't he going to question you? Then what are you going to say then? How are you going to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then? Wallahu ahakku an taqsha. So whenever you are afraid of the meeting with people, remind yourself of the meeting with Allah. Wallahu ahakku an taqsha. فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِّنْهَا وَطَرَى Then when Zayd fulfilled from her his need, Zayd, رضي الله عنه, the only companion who is mentioned by name in the Qur'an. Now you know why this name is so common? Why is it so common? Because it's mentioned in the Qur'an. And every time you say it, what do you get? How many good deeds? 30 good deeds for every letter. Zayyadal. So, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ Then when Zayd, رضي الله عنه, fulfilled minha from her. From who? Zainab, رضي الله عنه. When he fulfilled from her wataran, his need, his purpose. Meaning the purpose, the object of zawjiyah, of marriage. Meaning he fulfilled whatever need he had of her. And the meaning that it gives over here is that when he divorced her. Meaning when the purpose of marriage was over, that's it. They were not interested in one another anymore at all. And he divorced her. When the matter was over, what happened? Zawajina kaha. We married you to her. You meaning the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arranged for this marriage himself. The Prophet ﷺ was not asked, do you agree? Do you accept? Zainab anha, she was not asked, do you agree? Do you accept? What do we see? Zawajanakaha. That's it. We got you married to her. This was Allah's decision, His will. And it was done. It was carried out. Typically in a marriage, what happens? You need the man to propose to the woman. And you need the wali of the woman to accept. And you need the girl, the woman to accept as well. The ijab and the qubul. The witnesses, the wali, the mahar. All of that is a part of marriage. But we see that this marriage was a very different marriage. It was a very special marriage. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did it Himself. There was no ijab qubul. No witnesses, nothing. Which is why we see that Zainab radiallahu anha, she used to boast to other wives of the Prophet sallallahu saying that your families arranged your marriages. But Allah arranged my marriage from above the seven heavens. Your families arranged for your marriages, 
But Allah arranged for my marriage from above the seven heavens. Zawajinakaha. See the reward she got? She obeyed the Prophet ﷺ. When he told her that she should marry Zayd, she didn't want to. It was very difficult, but she accepted. What do we learn? That when a person obeys the command of Allah and His Messenger, he never suffers loss. Never. Look at how Allah rewarded her. Zawajinakaha. And why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have her married to the Prophet ﷺ? In order to abolish the custom that was prevalent in that society. Which custom? That you cannot marry the ex-wife of your adopted son. And that's what is mentioned over here. لِكَيْلَا So that not. يَكُونَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حَرَجٌ So that there is no haraj upon the believers. Haraj, any restriction, any difficulty, any uneasiness, any sin. Any sin in what? فِي أَزْوَاجِ أَدْعِيَائِهِمْ Concerning in the matter of the wives, meaning the ex-wives of who? Adiriyaihim, their adopted sons. Adiriyah is a plural of da'i. Remember? Adopted son. Meaning there is no restriction upon them when it comes to marrying the ex-wife of who? Their adopted son. What does it show to us? One more fiqh issue we learn from here. That if a man can marry the ex-wife of his adopted son, then that means he is not her mahram. You understand? He is not her mahram. If he is allowed to marry her, that means he is not her mahram. So she has to cover before him. إِذَا قَضَوْ مِنْهُنَّ وَطَرًا When they have fulfilled from them their object, their need, their purpose. Purpose of what? Of marriage. Meaning when they have divorced them. So when their adopted sons have divorced their wives, there is no restriction upon the believers to marry them. وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ مَفْعُولًا And the amr of Allah, the command of Allah, that is to be executed. No matter how much people dislike it, no matter how much people try to avoid it, but something that Allah has decreed, it's done. Allah decreed that this marriage should take place. The Prophet ﷺ said to Zayd, أَمْسِكْ عَلَيْكَ زَوْجَكْ وَاتَّقِ اللَّهِ He's making him fear Allah. Don't divorce her. But what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it happen. وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ مَفْعُولًا The command of Allah, it's carried out, it's done. No one can oppose it. No one can resist it. What do we learn from this ayah? Zayd رضي الله عنه, he came to the Prophet وسلم, complaining about his wife, asking him, what do I do? Permissibility of discussing marital problems with someone of knowledge. Why? For the purpose of advice. Not for the sake of just complaining and making your spouse look as someone who is very evil. You see, problems, they happen between a husband and wife. It's normal. And it's best that the husband and wife should resolve that problem amongst themselves. But sometimes it reaches a point that they cannot resolve it themselves. So instead of fighting all the time, instead of arguing all the time, being upset with one another all the time, what should they do? Ask someone for advice. And ask someone for what? Only for advice. Not that you're going to someone and just venting. I'm very angry at my husband. He did this, he said this, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. And a list of complaints to who? To a friend who cannot do anything. Anything at all. What's the point? There is no benefit whatsoever. What did we learn? That لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم Allah does not like that evil words should be uttered, that someone should be spoken bad about, except for the one who has been treated unjustly. And even then, why should a person do so? In order to gain help in order to seek some advice. So we see that Zayd anhu, he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he spoke to him seeking advice. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, أمسك عليك زوجك واتق الله. Secondly, we learn from this ayah that a man should not be hasty in divorcing his wife. Because what did the Prophet ﷺ advise him? Despite the fact that they couldn't get along, أمسك عليك زوجك واتق الله. And similarly, a wife should not be hasty in demanding divorce. Sometimes what happens? People just say, oh, we're just different. This is what women say. I'm just so different from my husband. We just never get along. We're always arguing. There's not even one thing that we can agree on. But if you give it some time, 
If you compromise a little bit, he compromises a little bit, it's quite possible you can make that relationship work. But sometimes people get so emotional and they just make up their minds, I'm going to take divorce. This is going to end in divorce. And because they have made that decision, what happens? It actually happens. It actually ends up as divorce. And if a person accepts that he is my husband, I have to accept him, I have to live with him, then what will happen? It will make it easy for her to adjust. Now, certain situations, you try, you try, it doesn't work out. Then obviously this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the choice to divorce. However, right at the beginning, they said one thing, you don't like one thing, immediately divorce me, divorce me. This is not correct. A person should not be hasty. They should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning this. Because this is the advice that the Prophet ﷺ gave to Zayd radhiallahu anhu. Wattaqillah. Another thing that we learn from this ayah is that the fear of people existed in the prophets of Allah even. The fear of people also existed in the prophets of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ wattaqshan nas. However, it did not overcome them. And this is how it should be with us as well. Now sometimes what happens, we learn about something, nobody is doing it in our family. Nobody at all, not even one person. Could be something as hijab even. Could be something as studying something that nobody in your family has ever studied. Could be selecting something for your children that no one in your family has ever done for their children. That you want your child to become a hafiz, no one in your family has ever done that before. It's like going against the norm. You were afraid at that time. But what should you remember? This fear should not overcome me. It's natural to be afraid. However, I cannot stop doing this good thing just because of the fear of people. Then we also learn from this ayah about the permissibility of marrying the ex-wife of one's adopted son. And what was the purpose behind the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ with Zainab al to abolish this custom. Because this custom, if it was not abolished, it would create a lot of problems. It would create some restriction. A restriction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not set, He has not imposed, it would create those restrictions and make the life of people difficult. So it was necessary that it be abolished. Because many times people complain, what's the big deal? Why was it necessary to abolish this? It was because this is something that Allah did not decree. This is something that was invented. And if it was not abolished at that time, imagine it would continue for the rest of the time. Because people look up to that society. The society at the time of the Prophet ﷺ that is looked up to in everything. So if it was not abolished at that time, this custom would continue. It would be prevalent. And this is something that Allah has not decreed. What does it show to us? That innovations must be abolished. We cannot just accept them. Because if they're accepted, if they're considered as a norm, very soon they're going to be considered as a part of religion. They will be considered as a part of religion. If they're considered as a part of religion, that's fabricating a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا كَانَ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ مِنْ حَرَجٍ There should be no constriction, no restriction, no feeling of uneasiness. For who? For the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Concerning what? فِيمَا فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَهُ Concerning that which Allah has made obligatory for him or concerning that which Allah has. What's the second meaning of فَرَضَ? Allowed something. Because remember there are two meanings of the word فَرَضَ. One is to make something mandatory from the word فَرَضَ, an obligation. And the other is to allow something. And especially when this word is followed by lamb. So, those matters which Allah has permitted for him or those commands which Allah has made mandatory for him to observe. Like for instance, the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ with Zainab anha. Did he have a choice with regards to that? He didn't have any choice. So when Allah has made it obligatory for you or if there's something else that Allah has allowed for you, then there should be no feeling of uneasiness. There should be no feeling of discomfort. For who? For the Prophet 
And the same is also for who? For his ummah. Because whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a command, it's not to make our life difficult. We have learned earlier in Surah Taha, ayah number two, that ما أنزلنا عليك القرآن لتشقى We have not revealed this Qur'an to make you miserable, to make you unhappy. So any command that Allah has given, we should not have any feelings of discomfort, uneasiness concerning them. Sunnat Allah, this is the way of Allah. What does it mean by this? This is the way of Allah fil ladina khalaw min qabl. Concerning those people who passed on before as well. Meaning that whenever in the past as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave an obligation to one of His servants, what was required of His servants? That they should accept willingly, without any feeling of uneasiness or discomfort. This has been the way of Allah. That there should be no difficulty in accepting the command of Allah. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed something, people should do it happily, without the feeling of that they're doing something wrong. When Allah has permitted something, they should be able to do it freely. This has always been the case from the beginning. وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ قَدَرًا مَقْدُورًا And ever is the amr of Allah, the command of Allah, a qadr, a destiny, a decree that is maqdur, meaning that is carried out. Why is this mentioned over here? That if you look at the context of these ayat, what is it about? The marriage of the Prophet ﷺ with Zainab radhiallahu anha. That was a qadr, that was an amr, a decree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decided. And no matter how much people disliked it, no matter how much the Prophet ﷺ himself was afraid of it, did it not come to pass? Of course it did. Because whatever Allah decides, it definitely happens. What do we learn from this ayah? Many, many lessons. First of all, we learn from this ayah that if Allah has commanded something to His servants, they should do it willingly. They should not do it with any feelings of discomfort, any feelings of unhappiness, because this is not why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave His commands to us. Whenever Allah instructs something to His servants, it is always for their own good. It is always for their own benefit. Think about it. Why do we feel uncomfortable when following a particular command? What is it that makes us uncomfortable? What makes us uncomfortable? The fear of other people's reaction. What else makes us uncomfortable? We're going against our desires because we've never done it before. That makes us uncomfortable. But what do we see? That regardless of how other people will react, regardless of how much we have to control our desires, go against our nafs, whether or not we have ever done it before, we're doing it for the first time. If Allah has commanded something, there is good in it for us. Even if we don't see it coming. The stories that we learned earlier about all those companions who obeyed the Prophet ﷺ, even if it was concerning their marriage, did they suffer at all? They didn't suffer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the very best in this dunya and also the akhirah. So, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded something, there should be no feeling of discomfort, of unhappiness, of uneasiness. Rather, a person should take the commands of Allah willingly, happily, with an open heart, with happiness. That this also... Allah wants me to do. Through this also I can come closer to Allah. I can gain His pleasure. Also we learn from the Saya that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed something, if Allah has permitted something, simply because it goes against our wishes, it goes against our culture, our tradition, it doesn't mean that we begin to start objecting at it. Or we are in denial of it. It's quite possible that it doesn't make 100% sense to us, which is why we would never choose it for ourselves. It's possible. However, we should not have any haraj in our hearts. If Allah has allowed something, somebody is doing it, let them do it. Don't object. Don't oppose them. مَا كَانَ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ مِنْ حَرَجٍ There is no 
discomfort upon the Prophet ﷺ. There should be no haraj on the Prophet ﷺ. And haraj again gives meaning of restriction, difficulty, discomfort. Fima concerning that which فرض الله له Allah has imposed for him. Meaning something that Allah has made obligatory in the Prophet ﷺ. There should be no discomfort for him. Meaning, something that Allah has obligated for him, he has to do it. What does haraj mean? Tightness, discomfort. When your heart feels tight, when you're uncomfortable, when you find it awkward, you don't want to do it. So the Prophet should not feel uncomfortable in doing what Allah has faradah upon him. What Allah has obligated upon him. Now, the marriage to Zainab was what? An obligation upon him. So there should be no discomfort in this. No feeling of awkwardness in this. No feeling of, you know, being uncomfortable. Because this is something that Allah has made obligatory for him. And the word faradah is used in different ways. But when the word faradah is followed by lamb, like faradallahu lahu, then it also gives a meaning of making something permissible. Making something permissible. So when Allah has made something permissible for His Prophet, then He should not find it difficult to accept it. He should not find it awkward to do it. If Allah has allowed it, then we shouldn't be feeling awkward about it. We should accept it. Now if this is with regards to the Prophet ﷺ, what about other people? The same thing. If Allah has made something mandatory on the believers... What should they do? Should they feel restricted, constricted in their hearts? This is so difficult. This is so hard. No, they should not feel like that. Similarly, if Allah has allowed something, what does it mean? We should not feel uncomfortable about it. We should not feel awkward about it. You see, there are some things in the sharia, something that Allah has allowed, something that Allah has permitted. And because it goes against our society, it goes against our culture, the way that we have been raised, we find it very, very difficult to accept. For instance, for some people marrying their first cousin, hey, how is it possible? I can never ever you know, marry my cousin. He's like my brother. But we see that this is something that Allah has allowed, so there should be no feeling of awkwardness in this. Polygamy, multiple wives. What happens when you hear that, oh my God, so and so has gotten married again. He has a second wife. Or she has accepted to be the second wife of someone. What happens? The entire family opposes. Why? We find it awkward. We find it strange. We find it weird. But what does Allah say? You should not have any haraj. Allah has allowed it. Allah has permitted it. They're not doing anything wrong. When Allah has allowed it, then you should not have any feelings of awkwardness. It's so weird. So awkward. How is it possible? Don't think like that. Like for example, different types of halal food which other people don't like to eat. For instance, when it comes to eating the food of the Ahlul Kitab, which they have slaughtered properly, if they have slaughtered it by mentioning the name of Allah, then you are allowed to eat it. But you find it like, oh my God, this is something that is kosher, I mean, of the Bani Israel. Don't think like that. If Allah has allowed it, He has allowed it. There should be no haraj. Similarly, when it comes to eating particular foods that we find weird because it's not a part of our culture, and if other people are eating, we're like, how can they eat it? Raw fish? There's no sin in eating it. No sin. If Allah has allowed it, it's permissible. Okay? So, once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed something, and a person is doing it, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly normal. You should not feel awkward about it. Now it's one thing that you would never choose it for yourself. Okay. If Allah has given a choice, perfectly fine. You don't choose it for yourself? No problem. But if other people are doing it, don't oppose them. You understand? Don't oppose them. Because sometimes what happens? If, let's say, a girl wishes to get married to a particular man and he's married from before, people will not support that marriage simply because she is marrying someone who's already married. She is marrying someone who's divorced. They will not support the marriage. 
This should not be our way. Think about it. What she's doing, what he's doing is halal. They're getting married. She has a permission of her wali. They have agreed. And if she's asking for something, it's legal. It's her right. So, as long as a person is doing what Allah has allowed, we should cooperate with them. Because many times what happens, a family does not cooperate in these ways. No way. This is something that we don't do. This is something that we never do. Marrying outside the family. Allah has allowed that. But some people, they don't accept it. What does Allah say? There should be no haraj, no discomfort. We have learned earlier in Surah Taha, ayah number 2, that ما أنزلنا عليك القرآن لتشقى We have not revealed this Qur'an to make you miserable, to make you unhappy. So, any command that Allah has given, we should not have any feelings of discomfort, uneasiness concerning them. Sunnat Allah This is the way of Allah. What does it mean by this? This is the way of Allah فِلَّذِينَ خَلَوْ مِنْ قَبْلِ Concerning those people who passed on before as well. Meaning that whenever in the past as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave an obligation to one of His servants, what was required of His servants? That they should accept willingly, without any feeling of uneasiness or discomfort. This has been the way of Allah. That there should be no difficulty in accepting the command of Allah. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed something, people should do it happily, without the feeling of that they're doing something wrong. When Allah has permitted something, they should be able to do it freely. This has always been the case from the beginning. وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ قَدَرًا مَقْدُورًا And ever is the amr of Allah, the command of Allah, a qadr, a destiny, a decree that is maqdur, meaning that is carried out. Why is this mentioned over here? That if you look at the context of these ayat, what is it about? The marriage of the Prophet ﷺ with Zainab anha. That was a qadr, that was an amr. A decree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decided. And no matter how much people disliked it, no matter how much the Prophet ﷺ himself was afraid of it, did it not come to pass? Of course it did. Because whatever Allah decides, it definitely happens. What do we learn from this ayah? Many, many lessons. First of all, we learn from this ayah that if Allah has commanded something to His servants, they should do it willingly. They should not do it with any feelings of discomfort, any feelings of unhappiness. Because this is not why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave His commands to us. Whenever Allah instructs something to His servants, it is always for their own good. It is always for their own benefit. Think about it. Why do we feel uncomfortable when following a particular command? What is it that makes us uncomfortable? What makes us uncomfortable? The fear of other people's reaction. What else makes us uncomfortable? We're going against our desires because we've never done it before. That makes us uncomfortable. But what do we see? That regardless of how other people will react, regardless of how much we have to control our desires, go against our nafs, whether or not we have ever done it before, we're doing it for the first time. If Allah has commanded something, there is good in it for us. Even if we don't see it coming. The stories that we learned earlier about all those companions who obeyed the Prophet ﷺ, even if it was concerning their marriage, did they suffer at all? They didn't suffer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the very best in this dunya and also the akhirah. So, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded something, there should be no feeling of discomfort of unhappiness, of uneasiness. Rather, a person should take the commands of Allah willingly, happily, with an open heart, with happiness. That this also, Allah wants me to do. Through this also, I can come closer to Allah. I can gain His pleasure. Also, we learn from the ayah that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed something, if Allah has permitted something, simply because it goes against our wishes, it goes against our culture, our tradition, it doesn't mean that we begin to start objecting at it. 
or we are in denial of it. It's quite possible that it doesn't make 100% sense to us, which is why we would never choose it for ourselves. It's possible. However, we should not have any haraj in our hearts. If Allah has allowed something, somebody is doing it, let them do it. Don't object. Don't oppose them. الَّذِينَ يُبَلِّغُونَ رِسَالَاتِ اللَّهِ Those people who convey the messages of Allah. Who is this referring to? The prophets, the messengers, الَّذِينَ خَلَوْ مِنْ قَبْلِ Those who passed before, the righteous people. So what did they do? They conveyed the messages of Allah. بَلَّغَ يُبَلِّغُ تَبْلِيغ And what does تَبْلِيغ mean? To gradually convey something. In a way that the receiver can take it in easily. Not that you bombard someone with information the first time you see them. Like for example, somebody becomes a Muslim and what happens? They're given so many books to read, so many lectures to listen to. Or for instance, someone, you want to call them to the deen, you want that they should come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they should study the deen. Sometimes what do we do? We give them so many heavy literature we give them that they would be unable to read themselves. What is tabligh? To gradually convey. Because remember, this is taf'il, and it gives the meaning of doing something gradually. So why convey gradually? So that the other can take it in. He can receive it. He can accept it. He can internalize it. Because if you give too much at a time, then what happens? A person gets afraid. I cannot handle this. No way. I can never do this. He gets frightened and he begins to run away. So what do we see over here? What was the way of the previous messengers? That they conveyed the messages of Allah. How did they convey? Gradually. Which is why we see that the Qur'an, the Sharia of the Prophet ﷺ, how long did it take for the Prophet ﷺ to convey that? 23 years. Gradually, one thing after the other. And certain commands that were difficult for the people to accept, how were they given? Gradually. Like for example, the prohibition of khamr. How was that given? Gradually, in stages. And most of the rulings, where were they given? In Medina. So, the way of the Prophet of Allah, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes is what? That the message should be delivered gradually. So, الَّذِينَ يُبَلِّغُونَ رِسَالَاتِ اللَّهِ Before this, there is an implication that Allah praises such people. Who? Those who convey the messages of Allah. And risalat is a plural of risala. وَيَخْشَوْنَهُ And they also fear Him. Who does Allah praise? Who does He like? Those who convey His messages. And also those who fear Allah. Because to convey this message... The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is necessary. Why do you think so? Why is the fear of Allah necessary to convey the message? That when a person conveys, he will definitely face opposition. He will not experience acceptance immediately. So in that case, what does he need? The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep him going. Because sometimes what happens? The fear of people makes us kind of change or water down the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does a person need over there? The fear of Allah. That whether or not people like it, I cannot alter this. You understand? Why else is it needed? So that one can convey completely without leaving anything out. And we see that the Prophet sallallahu did he have this fear as well? Yes. Which is why he conveyed everything. And I mentioned to you, about the ayah that وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَ اللَّهُ مُبْدِي If the Prophet ﷺ were to hide anything of the Qur'an, he would have hidden that part. And because he passed it on to us, that is an evidence that he conveyed fully. Why else is it needed, the fear of Allah, to convey the message? So that a person has his intentions straight. That he is doing it for the sake of Allah, not to gain praise, not to become famous. So, الَّذِينَ يُبَلِّغُونَ رِسَالَاتِ اللَّهِ وَيَخْشَوْنَهُ وَلَا يَخْشَوْنَ أَحَدًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ And they do not fear anyone except Allah. They only fear Allah. 
They don't fear any criticism. They don't fear any people. They don't fear the traditions, the customs of the society. No. They convey whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told them to convey. Such people, Allah praises them. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ حَسِيبًا And sufficient is Allah as Hasib, as one who takes account. Hasib from the root letters, Hasin ba. And it's from the word Hisab. And what does Hisab mean? Accounting. So Hasib is one who takes account. So, وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ حَسِيبًا Sufficient is Allah as one who keeps account of the deeds of His creatures. And He will call them to account for it. Why is this mentioned over here? That the obligation of the messenger is to only convey. And who is going to question people about their deeds? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ حَسِيبًا now this ayah primarily, it speaks about who? The Prophets of Allah. But in this is guidance for all those people who are the warasatul anbiya, the heirs of the Prophets. And who are they? The ulama, those who have the ilm of deen. And when a person has the ilm of deen, what is his responsibility? That he has to convey it forward. So this ayah teaches us how we are to convey the message forward to people. In what way? That first of all it should be done gradually. Secondly, what should a person be conveying to people? Risalat, the messages of Allah. Not fabrications, not innovations, not a person's own whims and desires and ideas and philosophies, but rather what should a person convey? The deen of Allah, risalat. What else does a person need? The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And fourthly, this realization that my duty is to convey and Allah, He will call to account. Let's listen to the recitation of these ayat.